welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, NFPA 70E, Are You Compliant or Safe? I'm Ed Rutkowski, Editor-in-Chief of the Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for participating, and especially Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring today's webinar. Our speaker today is Derek Sang, who has been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry in a variety of roles for over 20 years. In his current position as a technical training manager, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark University. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing, helping companies design and implement an FR clothing program and comply with the OSHA standard for training requirements for PPE. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Derek. Thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Ed, and uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us on uh, the webinar today. So uh, first, good morning and or good afternoon, depending on where you're listening. And as always, it's my pleasure to uh, participate with the AIHA. So let's get started. Let's get the disclaimers out of the way before we go on to the good stuff. This presentation is for informational purposes only. Customers of Bulwark Protective Brands are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protective Brands are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with the appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwark Protective Apparel does not make any representation that these garments protective gear will protect wearers from injury. So that's out of the way. Let's get on today's uh, webinar. Uh, are you compliant or safe looking in and around NFPA 70E? Well, focusing on the 2018 edition and specifically within that, the arc flash hazard. So real quick, uh, who's responsible for their employee safety? Well, if you've had any doubts, it's the employer. The most basic contract we enter into between employee and employer is covered in the general duty clause. That's where you will not hurt, maim, or kill me uh, as an employee in your facility. So in order to do that, what do you have to do? Well, we always refer everything back to what does your hazard risk assessment say? What are your hazards? And if you have hazards, then you have to select and have the employees who are going to be affected by that hazard have PPE, and you have to train them on the PPE. So how do you do that? Well, that's where we want to look to our consensus standards, whether that's ASTM, ANSI, or in today's discussions, we're talking about the NFPA. So why should we be concerned with electrical safety? Well, it's not the leading cause of job injuries. It's not the leading cause of fatalities but they are disproportionately fatal and costly. We all know the numbers. We've all see, seen the research. In general industry, one fatality per 300 recordable. Electrical, it is 10 times worse than that. So one fatality per 30 recordables, give or take. So it is very disproportionately uh, affecting us. Uh, if you look at the top 10 citations that OSHA is doing every single year, depending on the year, and it does vary, but you're going to see two to three of those top 10, 20 to 30 percent, year in and year out, are in and around electrical. Why? We know a lot about it. We do a fairly decent job, but we are still having a lot of incidents in and around that, and we are very conscious of going out and pointing out to folks going, you've got potentials here to the point to where I have to write you up. And then you have to go around making sure you fix that because we know that when these things go bad, they go really bad. There's no really such good such things as small electrical accidents. So when we're talking about what we're talking about today, understand NFPA 70E general industry working on or near energized electrical equipment covers a lot more than what we're talking about. But specifically today, when we're looking at the arc flash hazard, what is the real danger of arc flashes? The real danger is what we're showing you here. On the left-hand side, you have an arc flash. 
you can see all that thermal energy coming out of the, the gray box surrounding that mannequin that is wearing clothing. Three one hundredths of a second later, literally the blink of an eye, that arc is starting to dissipate. Why? That electrical equipment is designed when it recognizes a fault to shut down, and it shuts down relatively quickly, six cycles, four cycles, whatever the case may be, and cycles are really fast. There's 60 cycles in a second, so a six-cycle closure is tenth of a second. It is shutting down real quick. On the right-hand side, what do you see? All that thermal energy that is now wrapped around that mannequin that was wearing clothing is that clothing catching fire and now continuing to burn. So what's my point? You have now extended that event. By catching fire and continuing to burn, the arc flash is long over, and all the injury that is now being occur or is now occurring is due to what we wore in front of that arc flash. So what are arc flashes? Real quick. Uh, there's been lots written on arc flashes. Most people know the numbers. Most people understand all that's going on. So just quick review. Uh, depending on what periodical you're reading and how you're interpreting inside that arc gap, 35,000 degrees. Yes, about two and a half to three times the surface temperature of the sun is created in that arc gap. 10 to 18 inches outside of that, you can argue, depending on who, who publication you're reading anywhere from five to ten thousand degrees coming out of the box the thermal energy the blinding white light all that stuff is bad but you also get a bunch of other bad stuff when you superheat air that rapidly when you go from ambient air temperature of 70 degrees to say 10,000 in a blink of an eye you have literally created a bomb you get acoustic energy when that bomb goes off, about 165 decibels of acoustic energy in a Category 2 or 8 calorie or less arc flash. To give you some perspective, a 737 leaving a tarmac is about 135 decibels, so it's really, really loud. Uh, you get temporarily deafness. You're temporarily blind from the, uh, the initial flash, the blinding white light. Then you get concussive force. About 2,200 square foot pounds of concussive force is driving out at you. We see uh, cracked ribs, punctured lungs, and other kind of injuries occurring from that. And then also, if you're in a confined space, if you're in an electrical room and there's a cinder block wall behind you and you're trying to, along with that concussive force, you're trying to get away, you're now thrown in against solid objects. So we see secondary type injuries occur occurring in these types of uh, incidents. So we've got a lot of bad stuff going on. Where does this bad stuff potentially happen? Everywhere in general industry. If you have four walls and you're doing something industrial, more than likely you have gray boxes on those walls somewhere in your facility and anywhere from three to five percent of your employees or your contracted employees are going to be tasked with keeping the lights on, keeping the widget machines moving, keeping that business doing what it needs to do. All of those fall under NFPA 70E. We're also required by the law to, yes, protect our people, but when it comes to PPE, there's specific guidance within the law in 1910-132 that says uh, to us, we need to protect everything that is exposed to the hazard, whether that's your eyes, your face, your head. Well, we understand that stuff. Eyes, safety glasses. Uh, you've got your face. You could have, you know, for respirators, you could have uh, face shields. Uh, head, hard hats is the easiest one to think about. And then you start looking at clothing, if it could be involved in thermal events, whether that's arc flash or flash fire. We have to protect the extremities and the torso when exposed to those. So again, in summary, OSHA says you shall protect your people. There is more than enough regulations out there when it comes to PPE to tell us to do that. But where's the how? You shall protect me, but where's my how? My how comes from my standards. As we said earlier, 
whether that's the ANSI standards, ASTM standards, and NFPA standards, and within the FR and ARC-rated world, flame-resistant and ARC-rated world, we use these standards in combinations. ASTM gives us a lot of test methodology. And in fact, we'll talk about one of the ASTM tests today that help us get an ARC rating in order to tell you on NFPA what to wear. Then when we get into high vis and, and that, we're into ANSI 107 world, and, and there's FR and AR requirements in that world too. So there's a lot of crossover. So this is what your NFPA book on your desk today should look like. It's yellow in background, and you see the hierarchy of safety displayed prominently on the outside. I think it's 35 different times within the document that it directly addresses the hierarchy of safety. But what is the priority of NFPA 7E? Well, the biggest priority for, for this is not arc flash. It's don't get shocked. It is... De work de-energize, remove the energy from the equipment so that you can doff all your PPE, work on it easily, more quickly, put it all back together, re-energize it, and get on with your day. So the biggest part of 70E is working de-energize as often as it is feasible. When we're talking about what we are talking about today in the arc flash, because remember, the biggest piece of 70E is shock protection and not getting shocked and or worst case electrocuted. But in the arc flash piece, 70E was written primarily for two things. First and foremost, to prevent this. That is a screen grab of cotton ignition. For many, many years, electricians and electrical workers felt that cotton was a safety upgrade because why? It didn't melt or drip. It wasn't polyester. It wasn't polycotton. It wasn't rayons and other synthetics. So it was better, right? Well, up until the point it ignited, then it definitely was adding to the injury. The problem is, yes, cotton can absorb a lot of injury, but uh, excuse me, energy, but there's nothing in it to stop it from igniting. Once it gets to its ignition point, you are wearing fuel. So 70E was get electricians out of 100% non-FR cotton. The next big piece of 70E is then tell them how big a bomb they're standing in front of. Remember, the categor characteristics of a arc flash is an explosion. Okay, How big an explosion? Do I have a firecracker or do I have four sticks of dynamite? I would like to know so I can protect myself accordingly. The problem is, is without implementing 7E within your facility, without going through the arc flash hazard assessment, without labeling your equipment, I am literally walking up to an unknown. And trust me, just because it looks the way it looks from the outside does not tell me anything about how it can explode as an electrician. There are lots of examples when we talk to our engineers who do these uh, arc flash hazard assessments, they can look at two 480 panels, look exactly the same, they're fed completely differently, and you can have a CAT1 box and a CAT4 box side by side. So observationally, there is no indication of what I am stepping into. That assessment needs to be done so I know how to protect myself, whether it's my own electricians or one of my contracted electricians. We need to be able to communicate to them what they are up against. So the question is, how are you choosing your arc flash PPE or how are you communicating to your electrical team what arc flash PPE they need to be wearing? Well, there's really two methods. There's the incident energy analysis method and there is the arc flash PPE category method or more commonly known as the CAT method or the table method. You have to conduct an arc flash risk assessment to use either of them. Uh, there's some important notes to, to think about. There's pros and cons to each, but you have to do the calculations in order to know what the incident energy is to apply either of those. The table method and uh, Annex H are in lieu of short-term solutions when I don't know. So what do I mean by that? If I'm a contractor and I go into uh, 
one of my clients' buildings, and in that building I go to the back wall, and the gray box has no label on it. I don't know what the incident energy is. I have a couple of options. In 70E, I, have, I can use the tables. What is the piece of equipment? What task am I performing? And then the tables will tell me approximately what PPE to wear. The other way to go about it is I go to Annex H and I apply the information in Annex H. Very, very rudimentary explanation. The two-step approach. I wear eight calories of protection all day, every day, and or I climb into a 40 cal flash suit. The demarcation point is roughly about 1,000 volts. So if I'm looking at a 480 panel, I'm going to say, I'm going to assume then that puts me into CAT 2. That's my hard hat, face shield, rubbers, leathers, balaclava, hearing protection, eye protection, and insulated tools. And I go to work on that box. I'm close based on what we know and what the committee has said. Hey, under these conditions, yeah, we're, we're pretty confident that that will protect you. But without your hazard assessment, you don't really know. So how do we come up with how much protection you have or how much protection you need? What are we communicating in these ARC rated garments? Remember I said ASTM helps us in, in 70E document? Well, the ASTM F1959 test methodology is how we come to an ARC rating. An ARC rating is communicated in one or two ways. You have an ATPV, an ARC thermal performance value, or you have an E sub BT, energy break open threshold. Real simple. You are either, the, the fabric is in intact and I get a second degree burn through the fabric, or the fabric starts to fail and I assume a second degree burn at failure. Those arc ratings are then communicated in the label. So we adjust through the, the voltage, amperage, and gap. We standardize this test. We mess with the cycles in order to achieve higher or lower energies in order to ultimately come up with your arc rating. This is just an example of, of one. This garment happened to have an ATPV of 12.4 calories. There's 20 tests tests that have no burn under the fabric, 10 tests that have a burn under the fabric. At the 50% line with the stole curve, there's a 50% probability. Where that line intersects 50%, that is my arc rating. So what's an arc rating? A 50% chance of a second degree burn. So in order to find out what that is, I have 10 that pass and 10 that fail, and my 50% probability is based on the stall curve being applied to the results. Once I know that, I communicate that on my shirt, pant, or coverall, or my arc flash suit. I tell you what the ATPV is, or the E sub BT, and then you're going to match that PPE to your incident energy. And remember, we're going to do that either incident energy method, or we're going to use the CAT method. Remember these numbers, 8 cal and CAT 3. And we'll talk about those shortly, but 8 cal and CAT 3. So this slide here is telling you that whether you use the incident energy analysis method or the PPE category method, they have their pros and cons. There's a lot of caveats in the, in the 70E standard when you read about it to where you don't have an option. For example, if you have power systems with greater than estimated maximum available fault, maximum fault clearing times, or less than minimum working distance because you have to be closer than what has been calculated at, you can't use the CAP method. You have to default to the incident energy uh, uh, method, and it doesn't leave you any options. So for the CAP method, it's you have a few options in order to do it. How did they come across? What changed in the CAP method from 2015 to 2018? Uh, not a lot. Uh, the yes-no table was removed, so they took out one step that they included in 15 from 12. They went back to really the old method that they used to do in 12. Uh, you have more of the traditional task table. Uh, this is what it looks like. Not a lot has changed. We used to have hazard risk category up here on the top left. Now that's PPE category. All the ARC ratings and everything stayed the same. 
So a cat one, cat two, cat three, cat four. That's going to translate to your label that goes on that box if you're using the cat method. This is what you need to understand. So if I have three calories of incident energy, okay, that's a cat one box. Why? Because it's under four calories. That means I have to wear four calories or more protection. Uh, cat two box, if, it's, if it says seven calories on that, my incident energy says seven calories, that's a cat two box. I have to wear eight or more and so on. Cat 3, 25 or more. Cat 4, 40 or more. This on your right is how much more protection you need so that you can work on the appropriate category. So remember back to 8 and 3. What's the advantage of doing the incident energy analysis method versus the cat method? The advantage is, is when you get up over cat 2 or up over 8 calories. Look at the difference between 8 and 25. Now, I'm not a super math major, but that's 17 calories of separation between 8 and 25. So if you had an incident energy calculation of 11 calories, if you use the CAT method, you have to be in a 25 or greater flash suit. That PPE that you're wearing has to have more than 25 calories of protection in order to work on that 11-calorie box. If you use the incident energy method, what do you have to be? Just a little bit more. So you could have 11.5 calories of protection. You could climb into a 12-calorie uh, coverall and work on that box if you use the incident energy method versus using the CAT method. The CAT method forces you into 25 calories or greater. Or if you're using the simplified two-step approach of your facility, you're using eight cows or greater all day, every day. And then for anything over that, you're going into a 40 cal flash suit to work on that 11 cal piece of equipment. That's why it's so key to know what your uh, incident energies are because you can dress far lighter in many cases, if you know what the incident energy is, as opposed to kind of rounding up utilizing the CAT method. So just something to think about. We do all that discussion, these last four slides, to give you this information. What 70E is really telling you, what's the relationship between arc rated clothing and incident energy? Have more arc rating than incident energy coming out of the box. That's as simple as you can state how your PPE relates to what your hazard is when it comes to incident energy. Now, we always have caveats. Remember that incident energy is calculated at 18 inches. Where are your hands? Where are your wrists? Where are your forearms? They can be potentially closer than the 18 inches. But remember, rubbers, leathers. Rubbers and leathers are very insulative to the heat coming out in incident energy. In many cases, you have 30, 40, 50 calories of protection between your, your rubbers and leathers that you're utilizing when you're working on energized equipment. So if you're deploying all your PPE, that's going to be beneficial than not. So now you've selected your PPE for your hazard. You've gone through, you've decided, you've done your, your hazard risk assessment, you've done your arc flash hazard analysis, you know what your incident energies are, you've chosen whether you're going to follow the incident energy method or the CAT method, and now you have uh, moving on to proper use. Think about it this way. When we look at utilizing arc-rated clothing, we consider that, or it is actually considered secondary protective clothing. So if you have secondary, that means you must have uh, primary. So what is the difference between secondary and primary? The easiest analogy I can give you is think of firefighters. You have a big red truck, flashing red lights. I roll up to a structural fire. More than likely, I've already donned the lower half of my bunker gear, including my special uh, footwear, the upper half of my bunker gear, and I've already slipped on my specialized gloves. I have a special hard hat slash helmet apparatus, 
And I also have one other key piece of equipment for long-term thermal exposure. I have a breathing apparatus. I then grab my pole axe and I voluntarily walk into a burning building. How am I able to do that? Well, first and foremost, it's in the job description. It's in the title. I'm a firefighter. Secondly, do I trust my PPE? Has it been tested for long-term thermal exposure? Absolutely. Now, we knock the fire down. We head back to the station. Do I need to be wearing all that PPE? Absolutely not. Not unless it's rookie hazing night. Okay, we're going to doff all our PPE, we're going to clean our PPE, and then we're going to get ready for the next time the alarm sounds. It is task-based. Why? I am knowingly going into a thermal event. In our world, in the industrial environment, whether it's an arc flash or a flash fire, when do we need to have our secondary PPE on? All the time. Why? These are accidental events. We are not knowingly going into a thermal event. We are protecting ourselves if something goes wrong. We don't build electrical equipment to blow up. But when it does, we are not going to have time to go get it. Task-based daily wear programs or task-based programs for where daily wear should be applied are doomed to failure. I mean, just run the math. Think about it. If you're going to trust your folks to say, uh, I have 10 electricians, they do an average of 10 electrical energized tasks a day per 70E, they're going to get in and out of their arc rated coverall as a unit, as a group, 100 times a day. That's 35,000 times a year. Is there one chance in 35,000 that that program, I may not have my gear on when I need to have it on because I chose not to put it on because I don't wear it all the time. Or I chose to let, let me take a look. Or it's too hot to put it on right now. I'll just voltage test this. No one's looking. I'll just troubleshoot this system. No one's looking. So task-based programs and what we do, highly suspect at the very least. Remember, PPE is at the bottom. PPE is the least effective until when you need it then it's very effective. Assuming what? Assuming, as it's your last line of defense, that you're doing what? This is key when it comes to PPE. It doesn't work unless you're wearing it and wearing it correctly. I can have my hard hat on the job site, but if it's tucked underneath my arm and something falls from height, it's not going to do its job. I can have all the correct PPE, I can have my, the best ball harness in the world if it's not cinched up correctly, if it's not secured properly, if my D-ring's not attached to my fall protect, it's not going to protect me the way I need it. And your arc-rated flame-resistant clothing is no different. If I am not deploying it correctly, or worst case, I don't even have it when I need it, how well can it protect me? So some real quick do's and don'ts. This is how your electrical team should look if they're wearing shirts and pants. Notice the sleeves are rolled down and buttoned. It is buttoned up to the neck. And most importantly, it is tucked in. Hot air does a great job of obeying the laws of thermodynamics. When arc flashes go to the ground, they tend to do what? Rise. All that thermal energy comes up. It comes up the pant leg. And if you are unbloused, if you are sitting outside of your belt line, it will lift up that fabric and it will send all that energy underneath. And if you happen to be either A, not wearing anything, or B, wearing a lightweight cotton T-shirt, or C, worse, a synthetic it will cause potential injury that need not happen because why it wasn't deployed properly. This is what we see in the field far too often. And the excuse is, is hey, I'm not working energized right now, okay? But what's going to happen when you do go to do energized work and you forget? What can go wrong here? Now, a lot of our general industry electricians do work outside. They do work in uh, weather. You have a very expensive arc rated coat here and uh, that hoodie. 
You see that hoodie up around the neckline, the back of the head there? My question to you is, is that arc rated? Because now it's the outermost layer. What do our standards tell us about arc rated clothing? Always the outermost layer. Once that comes outside of that jacket, it needs to be arc rated. If it's not, you potentially have a lot of fuel sitting on the back of your head. And we are not mannequins. All those testings are done with highly trained mannequins. What are highly trained mannequins trained to do? They are trained to stand perfectly still. We don't. We are going to turn our head and get our face away from that explosion. Exposing what? What's sitting on the back of our neck there? Could it ignite? I don't know. I have no idea in this picture if that is arc rated or not. To the left, we have a ball cap. Same question. Is it arc rated? Uh, what about beanies? What about bandanas? What about uh, harness, uh, covering our harness, anything protecting, sweatbands, anything along those lines? Again, that energy could rise up. Uh, if we're not wearing, if we're wearing a hard hat and not wearing our face shield, could that get up inside our hard hat? Potentially. Be cautious. We've seen a lot of programs jeopardize that do everything right and then just one little nugget here causes, uh, causes injury, could jeopardize the whole uh, program. So FR use and training. Wearing the correct base layers under your flame-resistant arc-rated garments are key, very important. We train constantly on what you can and cannot wear underneath your PPE. Uh, make sure it is uh, non-synthetics, no meltables. Natural fibers only, that is your wools, in, typically in winter time, uh, cottons in the summer times, or nothing at all. Better yet, where we're seeing a lot of the swing coming to is going to arc-rated base layers. Uh, why? They're easier to monitor. Uh, they provide additional protection. Even if you're not looking for the systematic uh, inclination of that, it's still two layers of FR are better than one layer of FR and one layer of non-FR, or one layer of FR and nothing. In training, very key, very important. 1910-132 walks you through all the things you need to do. 70E says train them every three years on their arc flash PPE and or as their job duties change. If you go from unqualified to qualified, etc. If you're new to the job, if you switch from departments, uh, new training, etc. is required. 132 tells you when PPE is necessary, what PPE is necessarily, how to properly don and doff it. That's our fancy way of saying putting it on and taking it off. Adjust it correctly. This is huge. What limitations uh, do you, does your PPE have? You are not Superman in this stuff. You are not bulletproof, and it's not a suit of armor. You can and will most likely be hurt in these events. We are looking to mitigate it. So what are the limitations? Then, obviously, proper care, maintenance, and we'll talk about that shortly. And then the big part down here, documenting that they have understand, having them demonstrate that they understand, and getting all those things as part of uh, your training and ongoing training that that's clearly understood. Verifying protection. So we've talked about, okay, we're done. Derek, how do I know that I'm getting the right stuff? Well, the first place to start and with a little bit of in, uh, information, you can understand and decode labels relatively quickly. You have a lot of labels on your ARC-rated FR clothing. Why? We are required to give you a lot of information. Uh, 1506 for us on the ARC side, we have to follow all this on here. We have to tell you where it was made, when it was made, how and what it's made of, how much protection do you have, and then we have to code it so that we can track it. Why? Because if something bad happens, we have to hold on to all that test documents from the roll of fabric, where it was made, when it was made, and what the test data was of that roll so we can confirm a whole bunch of stuff for when that event post-event happens. So we can do all that. Now, we have to do it in a certain way. The standards tell you what you have to communicate, how you have to communicate. So this is kind of like a the resume or the pedigree of that garment, and you can get a lot of information from your labels. 
So you have an arc flash hazard. Now what? Uh, you've estimated your incident your, your incident energies. You have uh, got your incident energy analysis done. The majority of your single layer garments today uh, in most facilities are going to be eight calories or greater. So what does that mean? That if most of my equipment is under eight calories, then I'm wearing more than eight calories of protection. My arc rated clothing program is pretty much dialed in. Now, we do know there are cases when you might have 80, 90% of your equipment under eight calories, and then you're going to have those few pieces of equipment that are going to be outside the norm or outside of that. They may be 12, 20, 30, 40, depending on what the gear is, MCCs, all those things. What can we do there? We can look at layering as an option as before we have to climb into the appropriate uh, arc flash suit. So what does layering provide us with? Well, first and foremost, remember I said that second uh, layer of protection, seven ounce, five and a half ounce, six ounce fabrics will fail. Remember I said you're not bulletproof in this stuff. We're looking to mitigate injuries. Break open in arc flashes is very, very real. The picture at the top is break open. That is the outermost layer beginning to fail. Why? Because either A, I was in front of equipment that was more than was advertised, or more than what I thought, or B, I was a lot closer than it was calculated at, so I was subject to a lot more energy. The other picture on the bottom is the other concern is, what are my guys, what is my team really wearing underneath their gear? Even though I, say, I see those little white inverted triangles, those upside down pyramids at the, at the neck of my team, that white does not automatically indicate that that's all 100% cotton, does it? Can we go to uh, Target? Can we go to Walmart? Can we go anywhere and get white t-shirts that are blends? Can we get an 80-20, a 60-40? a 3070? Absolutely you can. So you've now introduced a meltable underneath your arc rated clothing. Now, the standard says your arc, if you're going to wear non-FR underneath, your outermost layer has to not break open. Well, under what conditions? We can have break open because we've exposed it to more energy than either A, the equipment stayed open longer than it needed to, B, I was closer than I thought, or it was bigger than I thought. All of those could potentially break open my outermost layer, exposing that non-FR or worst case, meldable. The picture below, trust me, 100% synthetic workout gear needs to stay in the gym. Those scars are due to having plastic deburred out of my skin from fully synthetic athletic undergarments. Let that sink in. Remember, it's 35,000 degrees in a gap, 8 to 10,000 degrees coming out at me. My arc rated shirt insulates and protects me. All that IR and all that heat still is passing through there. I'm just not igniting and continuing to burn. When it hits that 3.5 ounce polymer, at 2,200 square foot pounds of force, I'm going to liquefy the polymer, then drive it into my skin. That's what the scarring looks like. That young electrician's arc rated shirt worked perfectly. His fully synthetic undergarment melted instantaneously. So what do arc rated base layers do? Well, first, they take away the need to inspect those white t-shirts. I don't need to know because I'm going to see that you're wearing an arc rated base layer because the logo is going to be right there at the neckline. Secondly, if there is break open, I've now got an additional layer of protection. So I've eliminated meltables and I've increased my protection. Our standards even recognize that electrical workers in many times are going to be up against more incident energy than their protective gear can perform to. So what does it tell you? Right there in the standards, it says layering up. NFPA 70E has a whole annex. Annex M walks you through how to layer up and protect your folks. Now, regardless of the hazard, only natural fibers are allowed under the standards. Can we do better in the standards? Absolutely. Uh, now, if you're looking to have a systems approach, meaning that, hey, I want to get more protection than my single layer shirt gives me, then there are some caveats that you need to kind of understand, and we'll walk through those. 
So in 70E, I can just be, give me an additional layer of protection, then fine. I have an 8-cal shirt on. I put on my 5-cal base layer. I'm going to be more protected. Now, what work can I do? In a short sleeve shirt, I can still only do 8-cal work. Why? Because that single layer is right there from mid-bicep all the way down the wrist. That's my lowest uh, covered area with my ATPV. That means I can do less than 8 cals of work. My pants are going to be probably 12 to 14. That base layer is short sleeve, so I can't factor in systematically and help me do higher energy work. Now, if I go to a long sleeve base layer and I test this system as worn, not only am I more protective, now I have more information in which I can apply to the energized work I may be doing. For example, this shirt and a 7-ounce uh, outer garment might, when tested, give you 24 calories of protection. I've got 12 calories of protection in my lower half. I have a 15-calorie uh, face shield. I have a 12-calorie balaclava. Uh, assuming all my other PPE, what incident energy can I work on? Your lowest ATPV. So in this case, my lowest ATPV would be what? My pants at 12. Uh, so I can do 12 cals less work, even though I'm 24 at the chest. So it takes a little time to wrap your head around that stuff. Uh, notice again, if we are short sleeves, we do not have the benefit of the system. We just have more protection, so you can still only work on what your shirt would be because that would be the lowest. Lots of companies have done their calculations for you. If you're wearing their product over their base layer, they're going to give you a number. For example, here I have a Cat 1 shirt, a Cat 1 base layer, 6.3 ATPV, a 6.4 ATPV. Those are two Cat 1 garments when, when worn independently, wear them together with the shirt over top of the base layer, and that combination is 24, which is CAT 2, which is just below CAT 3. So a significant increase in performance. But remember, what I told you, what else are you wearing factors into what you can do. Just because from the waist up your 24 does not automatically allow you to do 24 work. If your lower half is 12, your upper half is 24, and assuming your hard hat, face shield, and balaclava are all dialed in, and 12 is your lowest number, guess what? You work on 12 or lower gear. Nine, if you are wearing a base layer underneath that coverall and you are skivvies from the waist down, guess what? You're doing nine work. So hopefully that makes sense. Make sure you research your layerings, but there are some uh, key advantages to it. So as we dive into the care and maintenance, because that's the next big piece, is how do we care for all this really expensive PPE? Carefully. And we tell you how. All the standards say follow the manufacturer's guidelines. The manufacturers tell you in one of those many labels how to do that. If for some reason you don't like reading that small a print, jump on their website all the top manufacturers download their care and maintenance uh, sheets, PDFs from their websites are all readily available. The good thing is with today's fabrics, it's really, really hard to mess up good FR. You have to do a couple things. Uh, take into account no bleach. Okay, that's a no-brainer. I'm not going to put bleach in my navy coverall or bleach in my navy pants or whatever. The sneaky one is peroxide. Bleach and peroxide will do similar damage to your FR. Peroxide sneaks up on you because what? where is that? That's OxyClean. So we're avoiding uh, detergents with bleach. We're avoiding bleach in general, and we're avoiding uh, peroxide or OxyClean. Don't put any, any other additives that could pile up, things like starch. Stay away from those. Uh, stay away from a fabric softener, whether it's in the dryer sheets or the liquid, and those are the big weeds. Uh, do common sense stuff. Don't bring gear from the, your work and mix it and match it with your family's uh, non-FR gear. Uh, even just from a, a sanitation department uh, standpoint, you don't want to be taking what you do at work and mixing it up with your family stuff. So wash this stuff separately. For color retention, turn them inside out. Uh, don't over dry. Don't over uh, overheat. 
if you need to get stains out, you can take it to the, the dry cleaner, and yes, you can have them dry cleaned. Uh, tumble dry on low settings. Again, just common sense stuff. If it smells like fuel, it is fuel. Remember, keep laundering until it does not smell like fuel. What does staining mean? If it's clean and stained, your FR properties are fully intact. If it's stained because of a secondary accelerant and it's still during the workday and you smell like fuel, guess what you are? You are fuel. So either get away from the hazard, change out of that garment, and when you clean that garment, make sure that fuel odor has been removed. How to repair and replace this stuff? Common sense, uh, the rule of thumb, because there's nothing in the standards that says what those are. It says you can repair it, use like materials, and so save a couple of those old shirts, pants, and coveralls to make patches out of, and use FR thread, Aramid thread, Nomex thread. So go online, go on to Google, go Aramid thread, go online, if it's on Amazon, Purchase it from Amazon or purchase it online and get yourself a spool of FR thread. Now you can start making repairs. What can you repair? Well, thread worn or worn out, like on the top left here at the elbow, you can't repair that. That needs to be replaced. Uh, for holes and rips, holes smaller than a nickel, that's the rule of thumb, and tears three inches or less. So in the middle here, that hole is far bigger than a nickel. That tear is not only not on a seam, it's not going to be easily repaired. It's more than three inches. That's a replace. On the right here, you have a shoulder. It's on the seam. Could be less than three inches. Could you repair that? Possibly. And then here we have one on the seam, but it's obviously greater than three inches. Would you want to repair that? Remember, the integrity of your clothing, your PPE, your last line of defense, your safety belt has been compromised. You are not repairing it back to manufacturer specs here. You're doing a repair. Entirely up to you. I personally would not recommend it. So inspect your garments daily. Check for holes, rips, and tears. Check areas of heavy wear, such as elbows, knees, where the fabric may be worn thin, and the integrity of the seams. Take the same mindset with your FR, AR clothing that you do with your fall protection. All right? Take the same attitude you would with your hard hat. You don't allow hard hats with cracks and chips and other things to go into, into service. You don't have a crack, chipped thing, safety glasses. You don't wear just one uh, hearing protection because the, uh, the other side's all messed up, the, the foam is all torn, chipped thing. So keep the same mentality that you have with all your other PPE when you're checking this. Don't put it in service if you are in doubt. So appropriate to the hazard, always the outermost layer. Uh, wear it correctly, zip buttoned, tucked in, natural non-melting undergarments we've went over. Be cautious of uh, contaminants throughout the workday, and when you're cleaning it, make sure those contaminants have been removed and then repair correctly and remove from service when needed. Uh, just a little hint, when you're removing a particularly a bulwark garment from service, cut the triangles out. Uh, you don't want that PPE going into circulation where someone may think that they can just go ahead and use it. Uh, don't be taking it to goodwill and someone sitting there recycling it, going through into uh, another field when that's already, in your mind, no longer adequate PPE. So rule of thumb for us, cut out that triangle, cut out someone else's logo, make that garment unwearable from a PPE standpoint. Always rolled, uh, tucked, and buttoned. That safety sticker adorns a hard hat uh, in uh, Southern California to remind all their electricians how to properly wear it. Uh, this picture here is a very, very difficult, difficult reminder of uh, failure to verify uh, his arc rated shirt worked perfectly. You can see from mid bicep up, he rolled up the sleeves of his arc rated shirt. He doffed his rubbers for shock protection, his leather protectors to protect the gloves, took off all his PPE, and when he put that screwdriver inside that MCC, it was not de energized as he thought. That whole career changed literally in the blink of an eye, uh, and it didn't need to happen. So be cautious. Before we get to questions, just two quick slides, a couple quick slides to wrap up. 
remember I said we are exposed in general industry to the climates, and in, in many cases nowadays we're seeing folks having to wear reflective vests to and from job sites, on the job site, whatever the case may be. If you have rain gear, make sure your rain gear is tested to ASTM 1891. That is arc flash rain gear. Uh, for our vests, make sure our vests have ASTM 1506 and have an ARC rating in the vest. Anything other than that, you are jeopardizing not only your people, but your whole program. There are lots of products claiming to be flame resistant on the market that have only been tested to one standard. Uh, whether that standard is ASTM F2302 or ASTM 6413, these aren't performance standards. In fact, 2302 tells you in the standard not to be used in arc flash or flash fire, not to be used in high heat or extended uh, fires. So the standard says don't use it where we're trying to sell it. 6413 is a vertical flame test. It is not a performance test. It will fail miserably in an arc flash. We have tested it. We have seen it. We know it. Uh, NFPA 701, we see this in reflective vests. Be very cautious. This is not even a garment standard. You have no idea how that vest will perform in your hazard because it's not been tested to it. Uh, ANSI helped us out. In 2015 edition, they said, look, if you are not one of these standards, you cannot claim flame resistancy. If you are not flame resistant, you have to tell us on the label that you are not flame resistant. So what type of are you, what class are you, and are you or are you not flame resistant? That's what you'll see in all your uh, ANSI uh, 107 high-vis vests. Why are we adamant about this? This is what I see in the field. I see things like this. I see claims that this particular high-vis garment is tested to 6413, claiming that it has self-extinguishing properties which are alluding to that in some way, shape, or form, it has something that's kind of flame resistant. Self-extinguishing has nothing to do with flame resistancy when it comes to arc flash and flash fire. Secondly, it says on the same label of the same garment that self-extinguishing properties diminish with washing. What? So if you're taking something like this and thinking you have some FR, you could be dead wrong. So in this same garment, we say it's been tested to 6413. Oh, by the way, that's not a performance uh, standard. And ANSI 107 tells you, I have to tell you it's non-FR. So I tell you in the fine print here that per ANSI 107, this is non-FR. Then what do I do down here in the little logo? At the same time, in almost the same breath, I say, Type R, Class 2, FR. Is it or is it not? Well, I've just told you in three other parts of this label that it's not FR, but in this part of the label I'm telling you is it is. That, to me, is misleading at the very best. Be very, very cautious of your rain gear and your vest going into your program. So as we wrap up here and I get to hand it over to Ed for some questions, Everybody who's registered for this program will get uh, some detailed information in the next week or so where to download uh, this program and this information. So with that, I pass it over to Ed for some questions. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, we've got uh, about five or six minutes for questions, so I'll, I'll dive right in. And uh, Here's a question from Abdul who's asking about um, differences between U.S. and European standards. Yes. Yeah, so what is the difference between U.S. and European standards in terms of mannequin tests for the flash fire in seconds? He says he saw three seconds flash fire test for NFPA and four seconds flash fire test for ENISL. Good question. Uh, so the ASTM 1930 test methodology, really you can set that at whatever your standard happens to be on how long you want the duration to be. Uh, for the NFPA 2112, they have determined that it's going to be three seconds. That is just what the test protocol uh, requires. Uh, the EN standard, if they ask for four, that's great. If they ask for more, that's great. 
but what you have to understand on the flash fires side of it, and I won't go too deep into it because of time and also because it's kind of off of 70E. It's not an electrical arc flash or anything to do with that, but for flash fire, understand this. Unless you are calculating that in a confined space, a.k.a. a well hole, if your hazard risk assessment says, I need six seconds to get out of that well hole, then you need to have PPE that will protect you for six seconds. NFPA 2112 compliant garments are tested to three, so automatically they, they would be discounted. You would have to have a clothing system that protects to more than that. But do understand this, any testing on fabric that goes beyond three seconds, look at real world flash fires in the uh, industrial environment. They are rapid moving flame fronts by definition. They do not occupy a single point in time for three seconds. You are going to have to be in a confined space and or trapped or and or surrounded by fire, and that's a completely dis different hazard than the flash. So there's a lot more that goes into answering that question. I know when Ed gets me those emails, I'll hop on that, and I'll spend some more time with Abdul, but good question. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, Kevin uh, was asking about the, uh, you were talking about the labels on the electrical panel. Yes, uh, where should the label be placed? I've seen labels placed inside the door of the panel versus on the outside of the door. Is that acceptable? Is there guidance anywhere? The, uh, the labeled guidance, I believe, is it must be on the outside. Uh, because I don't want to have to open something up to tell me how to protect myself. Uh, I have no idea what the condition is behind that door. Uh, the previous uh, person could have, you know, they could have lost some screws and, and, and that cover could be half hanging on, not hanging. I have no idea. I don't want to open it up to see what I need to be doing to protecting myself. Now, that's obviously an extreme example, uh, but we want to have it on the outside. We want to have it to where I don't have to get into the arc flash boundary in order to know what to wear inside the arc flash boundary. So if I have to open it up, more than likely, I'm going to be inside the arc flash boundary, and that would not be, as I understand it, the proper interpretation and application of the labeling requirements under 70E. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brian uh, has a question. He says that New York State Department of Transportation has a building with uh, conservatively about 5,000 panel boxes, along with at least 100 large uh, generators. What is the most efficient way of conducting an assessment? Is there a software program available? Great question. Uh, when I get the report back, I will, I will give him some contacts from my hazard uh, assessment guys. Uh, that's something that I'm comfortable they would be willing to give you some insight into. That is well outside my, uh, my expertise, but I'll definitely get a, a resource in order to get that better answered. Okay, uh, Asia asks, what is the type of FR clothing that electricians wear, and can they have the snap buttons? So uh, the fabric that the garments are constructed out of today are going to be uh, – very similar. Um, you're going to look at really dual hazard is kind of most fabrics today. You're going to have an arc rating and you're also going to have NFPA 2112 compliance for flash fire. So these flame resistant arc rated fabrics are designed to, by definition, self extinguish, not melt, drip, or add to the injury when deployed properly. Uh, you have to match them up to whatever your incident energies are, what your hazard is. So I want to have a fabric that has more insulative uh, arc rating than does the incident energy coming out. Uh, that being said, we all, they all kind of work in uh, dynamic there. So read that last part to me again, Ed. I kind of just lost my train of thought a little bit. Oh, sure. Um, she's asking about the, the type of FR clothing that electricians wear, and can they have, uh, she says, the snap button? 
Okay, so when it comes to the actual construction portion of it, there's certain things that are and aren't allowed. Uh, obviously, from an electrical standpoint, anytime you introduce metal, uh, the hair on the back of all electrical safety folks kind of starts to tickle a little bit because I'm in introducing something that is potentially conductive into an energized environment. Uh, there is an allotment for a small amount of metal. We see it being allowed in belts, and we see it being allowed in uh, uh, other areas. Snap buttons in and of themselves are not a knockout. It doesn't mean that you can't have them. Uh, many folks choose not to have them because they don't want to introduce that, but there's nothing that I'm aware of that says categorically that a an electrician cannot have uh, metal snap buttons. Okay, great. Unfortunately, uh, that's all the, all the time we have for today. If you uh, submitted a question and we weren't able to get to it, um, it will get passed on to Derek uh, with our webinar report. Um, my thanks to Derek for his presentation today, for Bulwark for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our participants. Please keep an eye on your email for announcements of future Synergist webinars. Thank you, everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.